Hi, this is Matthew Baldwin of Mars Hill University, and this is the Ideas of Jesus video podcast. I'm here today with an old friend and former student, Seth Clark of Shelby, North Carolina. Seth is a graduate of Mars Hill College in 2011 with a degree in religion, and he went on to Claremont Graduate University to earn a Master's of Arts in Religious Studies in the year 2014. That's right, isn't it? 2014? Yep. Now, uh, Seth lives in Shelby, North Carolina, as I said, where he is a craft brewer and an advisor for Belmont Brewing Company. He's won many, or at least several, blue ribbons for his craft brews and is also the manager of Alternative Beverage in Belmont, North Carolina, which is the largest homebrew supplier in uh, Western North Carolina, I'm guessing. Western North Carolina, I would say. It, between between Asheville and where you get to South Carolina, so that's at least, yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is what, Seth, I love the story of your career in part simply because it proves that um, you can literally do anything with a degree in religion, an undergraduate degree in religion. So to all the naysayers, we say, go and do what you feel. And then, of course, I think that uh, you told me earlier that's a rosemary IPA Yes, that is of legal drinking age, just so yes. we're <laughs> Yes, yeah, I'm you, 31. You still look so. so young. Oh, thank you. Beer doesn't help anything. But. Well, oh. it's, it looks good on you. I've invited yeah. Seth here today to talk to us because Seth has had a long time um, interest in Gnostic Christianity and early Christianity and in the Gospel of Thomas in particular. And Seth, would you, as I recall, you did write your master's thesis um, largely on the Gospel of Thomas. Is that correct? Yeah. And yeah, it was on the Gospel of Thomas. Well, in Middle Platonism, but. And Middle Platonism, right. Yeah. So I've invited you here to talk about Thomas today and to talk about the idea or the the representation of Jesus that we find in the Gospel of Thomas and how that figures into and should figure into uh, contemporary thinking about who Jesus was and uh, how Christians have historically thought about Jesus. I'm particularly interested in the contrasts that exist between uh, the portrayal of Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John and what we find in Thomas, uh, between Q and Thomas, and also um, between the ways that contemporary American Christians might think about Jesus and the way that readers of the Gospel of Thomas seem to have thought about him. But first, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the Gospel of Thomas itself. There's some debate about the dating of this Gospel. In your opinion, and based on your research, would you say, is Thomas early or late? And what are the arguments, one way or the other? Early or late? Well, um, unfortunately, the case with Thomas, it's like a lot of things in uh, discussion of, of biblical literature or the Bible's literature as a, as a historical endeavor. Uh, those that say that it's late are doing so um, out of uh, concern, I guess, or respect for uh, the early dating of the uh, early dating of the uh, uh, of the canonical gospels, right? The synoptic gospels, and well, you know, the Gospel of John being the latest, right? Um, but, you know, uh, I, if you put faith commitments aside, right, um, can you still hear me? And I can hear you just perfect. fine. You're good. Okay. Um, making sure because I, my computer just rearranged itself and it did something I've never seen before, but this is very handy for this format. So, um, uh, or I own computer. Uh, so, but yeah, there has to be some arguments for a later dating of the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, most who, most who argue that believe uh, that it's written in the second century AD, right, um, at, at the earliest, uh, and that the uh, the things found in the Gospel of Thomas are uh, defensive, not defensive, but uh, are, are dependent upon the former former uh, synoptic Gospels, and so they'll say it's written around the the mid century uh, of the second century. So um, there's also the matter of the dating of the physical manuscripts. Um, Thomas, uh, like um, some of our more interesting sources has a, uh, a multi, multi-linguistic uh, background. So uh, there are references to Syriac and Aramaic in it, uh, but the two manuscripts we have, we have a full manuscript, well, mostly full, um, uh, written in Coptic, and we have a partial written in uh, Greek. Uh, and the ones that are written in Greek 
uh, they date to 200 CE and the Coptic is, uh, that's dated to the fourth century, uh, largely thanks to carbon dating, uh, which, you know, I know some are suspicious of, but we mostly still use it as a standard uh, in, in our studies, or at least the studies of uh, biblical literature. And uh, we know that the scribal activity of the Egyptian monks, basically Athanasius said, you know, you cannot read the books that are not on this list, and the monks hid them. So, and the Gospel of Thomas was one of the ones that they hid in the Al-Khamadi Library. So, um, but I argue otherwise, um, largely just because I, I, I see no reason uh, to think that the Gospel of Thomas is dependent upon um, these synoptic Gospels. Matter of fact, I think that if you look at the sayings of uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, I divide them into three categories. You have the, the putative teachings of the historical Jesus, uh, the saying relevant to like interactions with other first century Christianity is concerns with that would with, with and would only been limited to uh, early Christian groups. And uh, then there's the sayings that Jesus combined with the Middle Platonic theme, which either here nor there, that doesn't really tell us much about dating because Middle Platonism starts somewhere a few hundred years before Jesus is born and definitely runs several hundred years after Jesus is, uh, has uh, passed away. So, um, so the reason, so there's, there's, there's a parable of the sower, right? So the sower went out to sow, you know, blah, blah, blah. We find that in the synoptic gospels and, uh, but we find it with an interpretation and the gospel of Thomas, it stands by itself. Um, and so since it makes sense that a teaching comes towards interpretation, um, so to speak, uh, and then it stands on its own in the gospel of Thomas, uh, then it seems to, that, 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 the author of the Gospel of Thomas knew it apart from the synoptic tradition because the other versions of the tale, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, are kind of dependent upon their interpretations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you do you find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, and they they definitely interact and play with each other's uh, interpretations and not just the tale itself, whereas the Gospel of Thomas, you know, just throws it out there. Yeah. Here's the parable of the sower. You know, if you if you know the interpretation, you know the interpretation, right? Uh, you yeah. have to be in the know. Uh, that's so, that's. So what's just that? to clarify your point is, there are materials in the Gospel of Thomas which appear also in the Synoptics, but in a form in Thomas where they may be uh, coming from a source prior to the Synoptics, prior to right. Mark. Right, right. That's that's absolutely true. I I do think that that uh, much like that the Gospel of the Thomas is attributed to the Apostle Thomas, which, um, you know, whether that actually happened or not, it's a whole different story, but because it's attributed to the Apostle Thomas, one of his earliest followers, one of the 12, right? Um, then I think that, uh, that, you know, someone actually did hear this saying, either from Jesus or someone that was really close to Jesus and wrote it down in a form that was unadulterated and not interpreted, and not interpreted yet, so. Well, I have two branching questions that I want to ask you now, based on what you've said so far. And one is, for the sake of my students, who I'm pretty sure at this point are have they've heard the you invoke the term Middle Platonism a few times, and uh, I'm guessing that for a lot of uh, interested, educated folks who are interested in Jesus, Middle Platonism is going to just go over the heads. Can you tell us? Oh, just I mean, really middle Platonism really goes over the head of scholars is. most of the time because no one's really concerned with what middle Platonism, middle Platonism is. They think you've got what Plato, Plato said, then you've got what the Neoplatonists said, and then they forget that there's something in the middle, you know, well, um, that there's imagine, a culture. Uh, imagine, a hearer, tradition. imagine a hearer who isn't really clear on what Plato might have said or the Neoplatonists, and, uh, and here you are talking about middle Platonism. So what is middle Platonism? So middle Platonism is is that is that span between uh, Plato and Plotinus, and in, uh, in which uh, the teachings of Plato, are some of the ones that uh, Plato does not write these down. These are these are secret teachings. You know, these are things that Plato taught but did not write. Um, thus, you know, and some things they they do get later written down by you know his students and descendants of his students. Um, but it things on the nature of the universe and God and you know how creation came to be and things that are very relevant. Uh, to those with religious, uh, with basically with philosophy of religion interest, right? Uh, so, because that's the that's the other thing that CGU did really well, uh, other than the Akhamadi Library, was that they were very big into the philosophy of religion. So that was kind of what got me looking into. Well, wait a minute, uh, these texts do have to have a philosophical background. 
you know. Um, so is your so, argument that middle platonic philosophy of religion was influential on the group that, uh, or the author, um, the yeah, group that read? Yeah, I think, I, I think Alexandrian middle Platonism in particular was heavily influential on the Gospel of Thomas. Um, it's, it's the only context, phil, written, co written philosophical context in which the Gospel of Thomas, and ironically enough, the Gospel of John, uh, their, 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 what do you call it, their cosmology, the, their the ideas of God, the ideas of human and humans, all the, all the basically the things that you explore in a, and while you're pursuing, pursuing the love of wisdom, right, you know, you want to know about yourself and the world and others and God and, you know, and, and, and those types of questions in uh, the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Thomas seem to share uh, a very similar one, um, outlook, at least in those ways. Um, to, you, to give us a, just a quick synopsis, like what's the middle platonic idea of God? Well, so the middle platonic idea of God is the one, right? If you've got the monad, right? The the unmovable one. There, there is there is this being, this uh, this like a uh, in science. I think we call it a singularity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the singularity moves, or the mo the one moves, and thus the second principle is created. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the first and second principle create the third principle. And basically, the monad, the, just like the singularity, cannot be known, and you know, in in science. God cannot be known, you know, the, the one cannot be known. He's unmovable, unknowable. But when the second principle comes into being, that's, that's through which the rest of physical creation comes into being because you get the one, the two, and then the three, and, you know, and so on until you get, uh, what, do they, what do they call that? And uh, there's a word, uh, not multiplicity, but um, agnosticism, where the one becomes two, and then the two becomes. Uh, Are you talking about emanations? Emanation, yes. So basically, this is a form of emanation that's happening, and then the second, the second principle is through which creation comes into being, and then the third principle is which creation knows the divine. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, basically, um, in in uh, in Hellenized readings of like uh, the Psalms and the Proverbs and stuff, you find this figure of Sophia, right? Um, and mm -hmm. Sophia is the is that's the logos, that's the creative principle, that's through which the world comes to be, and then the third principle is Jesus, and so you know you've got. The, the 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 mother the father the one the mother and the son so it's more like a family and then when the son when the son leaves the world the holy spirit comes in you know and uh i know that's some heretical thought for a lot of your uh, uh more traditional religious folks but um that's kind of what's going on in middle platonism and that's the that's the thought that the early christians and uh jews well, we don't have to put the middle platonists on trial for their uh, theology, but it is interesting to understand that this kind of thing was going on um, a right. environment and, around early Christian groups and that they were influenced by these sorts of philosophies of religion. Right. Um, and did you want to, so there are some examples, I think, that I have, I have um, talk about themes and the, uh, see, what did I do? Oh, yeah. So. The, the, the category of the third sayings um, yes. of the Gospel of Thomas, those who contributed with take Jesus and put basically Alexandrian Middle Platonist thought in his mouth. Um, so uh, it was, so Middle Platonism, let's talk a little bit more, is, is a coherent system of thought based on a combination of Platonic, Stoic, and Aristotelian philosophies, um, basically proposed by Antiochus of Ascalon in 80 BCE. Mm -hmm. And then he provided an end goal of Middle Platonism as obtaining likeness unto God. Uh, and then that was quoted by Eudorus of Alexander in 25 BCE. So you can see these these thoughts taking form right before Christianity is on its rise, right? Yeah. And then you find, uh, I, I argue that you find at least uh, 10 different Middle Platonic themes. Uh, interesting enough, John Turner disagrees with me on this, the guy that wrote the, the book on Gnosticism, right? He read my mm -hmm. thesis, he says, good work, he says, but I don't think all those sayings mean what you think they mean. But, you know, there's always room to disagree, right? Uh, For sure. But, you know, what's that? For sure, there's room to disagree. Yeah. So, uh, but it was it was really cool for to get him to read my thesis and to write me an email about it. Um, but the uh, so the ten themes is the admonition to know yourself. Um, sounds familiar, right? You know, know thyself. For sure. Um, and then the understanding of the divine is the the the, the monad, the dyad, uh, and the the demiurge or the third agent as their as their realm of the physical that which becomes flesh, um, and and then the emphasis on unwritten or secret teachings, basically in the prologue, you know, I'm, I'm writing the teachings of Jesus down, but you need to know the unwritten ones as well. Uh, and then the end goal of achieving likeness unto God. Um, so 
in the Gospel of Thomas and also the goal of Middle Platonism was that you look at the physical manifestation of God and then you're invited to acquire that, you know, through the right understanding and practices, right? Um, so, and uh, the, the monks really liked it because, uh, you know, it appealed to their, their, their discipline of the flesh, you know, and dwelling on spiritual things and controlling their desires and whatnot. Um, when you say the monks, you're talking about the monks by the time we get to the third and fourth century. Yeah, yeah, the monks that had preserved uh, the text in Coptic, right? You know, um, this they, really they, transitions me to the to my next question, which is really, I, I feel like you're starting to get at this, but I'd like to hear you explicitly address it. When we're looking at the Gospel of Thomas, you're saying it. A lot of it's very early, um, but are we looking? But you're also then I hear you saying for things like putting Middle Platonic ideas into Jesus' mouth. So I'm wondering, are we looking at Jesus, like the Jesus of history, when we look at Thomas? Or are we looking at the ideas of uh, Thomasine Jesus followers, or is it some combination of the two? Well, you know, uh, it is definitely a combination of the two to, to kind of, to even to, uh, let's see, that was a question on our list there. Uh, yeah, number three. So uh, that question uh, is a great question, uh, especially if you don't know uh, much about how history is written or, you know, um, or any of these things. But it's, it's, also, it's also a bit naive, you know, and so much as you don't know, and we're, we're assuming our audience doesn't know, but whenever you're reading a written account of someone else's life uh, and teachings, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, Caesar, you know, Caesar's life or George Washington's life or Thomas Jefferson's life, um, you're looking at the ideas of the person that's writing them. Yes, you're looking at their, the, the, you know, the, the subject's ideas and teachings and writings, but you're looking at them through a lens, how they were understood by the, you know, the writer of the biography, right? Uh, and so, yeah, so the, the, the core of Gospel of Thomas, there are the teaching of Jesus and shared understanding of his, of his importance in early Christian communities. Early Christian communities definitely did have some things that they agreed upon, you know, that Jesus has the physical revelation of God and, you know, that he's important and uh, his, his deeds and that, or his, his teaching and deeds, you know, uh, revealed, you know, who God is and, and how we, you know, achieve, uh, God, you know, be reconciled unto God's self. So there, there's that idea uh, in early Christian communities, but the spiritual and the philosophical understanding uh, of Jesus composes, you know, the majority of the Gospel of Thomas text. So yes, you're seeing, yes, you are seeing the historical Jesus and interactions from the early Christian community, but you're also seeing a lot of Alexandrian Middle Platonism, you know, providing the, the context and the, the, the philosophy of the text, right? Yeah. You know. Well, it really raises the, the question of how this, um, what I think traditional scholarship might call a syncretism comes together. I'm uncomfortable with that term, but I throw it out there anyway. The, you know, one wonders were there uh, folks attracted to middle Platonic ideas about God who then discovered the Jesus movement, or did the Jesus movement in, in its um, in its growth in an Alexandrian context uh, just naturally yeah. draw in? Um, a sort of environment of talk about the deity that was informed by Middle Platonism. I mean, obviously we can't right. even know for sure, but so Plato was... Plato had this this understanding, right? That that the 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 population needed popular religion, right? They needed the creation that's and the understanding of the gods and that, and whatnot. But he also taught the secret teachings, right? Which later became Middle Platonism and the secret teachings, you know, the teachings that you don't write down, that you only talk about. The secret teachings, the understanding, those provide the understanding of what those myths and teachings really mean, right? Those those stories, those myths and legends. And so I think that's exactly what's going on here in the Gospel of Thomas. And I would argue it's going on in the Gospel of John as well, is that you know, you you have to you have to be in the know. The text invites you to come find this knowledge, but it's not going to explicitly tell you the knowledge that you need to know, right? Mm. Um, and I think that's I think that's certainly what's going on. Um, well, I know that, that from the from the saying number two in the Gospel of Thomas, or saying number one in the Gospel of Thomas, and he said, I'm reading from the scholar's version, pardon me, uh, whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. I mean, right there, at the first from the first saying, there's this invitation to discover meaning, right? And I, so I do right. think that there's something different about this 
material than what we find in the synoptics where there, or in John, where there is some kind of hint um, that there might be something deeper going on. In some places, right. it, it almost hits you in the face. It's so explicit that there might be something deep, deeper going on. But Thomas lets you know from day from the first saying, like, there's a secret meaning here. And yeah. it's the key to eternal life. Right. Well, at least the key to not facing death, right? Whether that life is eternal or everlasting is a, is a splitting of hairs. But yes. Okay. <laughs> this, this, is, this is how you become... Uh, uh, Unless you ask God Molinax, Molinax will uh, will have you down the road about that, um, um, about eternal and everlasting, because that's the quality of life. Uh, Kairos versus Kronos, right? Um, for sure, but for sure. Yeah, but that's also something that's interesting is that uh, the author Judas Thomas the twin, right? Or uh, Judas Judas Didymus Thomas, as is uh, written in the Coptic and in the Greek, uh, uh, you know, uh, Didymus D Didymus Judas Thomas. So uh, Didymus uh, and Thomas are the same word in two different languages of both being twin. So this is this is Judas the twin writing these things down. And, and what he's he's offering into you is that you can become a twin as well. Of who? Well, of God, of Jesus, right? Um, it's thought thought that you that you later find on in, in Thomas and Christianity, the idea that that your soul has a twin on the other side, you know. Um, and then when you have served your purpose on earth and you return to the divine, your twin or your robe is there waiting on you, right? Um, and that's that's the whole idea is the reconciliation of, of 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 your of your physical body and desires with your rational, you know, um, conflating those things into one, so that you are like the one, the the, the monad, right? So that you become like the Father, and that Jesus, the, the Jesus's teachings in the Gospel of Thomas are the way offer practices and insights into becoming the twin of Jesus, who is the son of the one, right? Yeah. So, so in terms of becoming the twin of Jesus here, I think this is a good transition to my next question, which is really about the portrait of Jesus in Thomas compared to the canonical gospels. You know, people will point out reading Thomas, there's no crucifixion story. There's no passion story. There's no exorcisms. Uh, or dramatic healings that I recall. I might be wrong about that. There's no, there's, right. there's maybe di kind of some references to miraculous kinds of ac actions, but there's no um, dramatic uh, divine man, Markin miracle stories. Um, and uh, Jesus seems a little bit more detached than he does say in the Gospel of Luke. And so I'm wondering, you know, if the, if the goal of the, the Thomasine Christian is to understand themselves as somehow the twin of Jesus, um, what did they think Jesus uh, was, and how does that differ from the Gospels? I might have talked too much already in asking that question, but I'd be curious to hear how you... Well, all right, so the picture of Jesus found in Thomas, how it differs from the synoptics or the Gospel of John, right? So section three in a uh, document that I that are previously written, um, basically, I say that uh, scholars often disagree about the uh, the identity in the Gospel of Thomas, the identity of Jesus. Some say that he's a, a, a itinerant philosopher. Uh, some say he's an Eastern sage like Buddha, and various others think him as a Gnostic messenger sent to uh, humanity from God to exhort them to the knowledge of the divine origins. Uh, but honestly, uh, Jesus is a philosopher, a sage, and a messenger uh, in the Gospel of Thomas. But his real identity in the text is greater than all of them combined, um, and that's that's similar to what we find in the Gospel of John, right? Uh, the Gospel of John, you have the Word, who is identical with God, through which all existence comes to being, the life, in in you know, the service, the light of all people, and finally becoming flesh, so that those that believe in Him will become the children of God, right? Um, that's all in the prologue. Uh, and in, in the Gospel of Thomas, he is the living Jesus, the light over all things from which all creation arose and shall return to, identifies those who follow the example as children of the living Father. Um, however, the roles that Jesus assumes in the Gospel of Thomas uh, reveals that his followers can become his, uh, his equivalent, uh, that is, his twin, and not simply sharing the divine presence, but become deified themselves, uh, which is, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's a hefty promise. Um, and, uh, you know, so Jesus, Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, unlike the Gospel of John, he's not the master, remember, no, no brewmasters, no masters. He's not the teacher. He's not the judge. 
uh, and he's not to be he's not to be worshipped as the revealer, the God and the example. Uh, uh, no, no, he's he's not the one to be worshipped, but he is rather the revealer, the God and the example uh, of the divine in which the fathers can become. So that's that's what's going on between uh, the Gospel of John, Gospel of Thomas. You know, uh, in in John, he is to believe to be believed in, and Thomas, you are to become Jesus, uh, which um, you can see why the church wouldn't care for that uh, idea too much. Um, and also in the Gospel of Thomas, uh, you, you find Jesus as a hierophant, a uh, philosopher, and, and uh, he's a human being, but he's more than a human being, right? Because he's real, realized his divine potential. Um, so, but as a hierophant, uh, you know, that's the high priest that interprets the words and, and the sayings and the myths uh, of, of mystery religions that, you know, the meaning was revealed during their initiation. So, uh, Jesus even states in the Gospel of Thomas, he says, I reveal my mysteries to those that are worthy of my mysteries, uh, which promises his, and he promises his followers an experience that physical senses are incapable of possessing. Um, and uh, yeah, it maintains his primary role as the only dispenser interpreter of these teachings, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then he even uh, to Thomas, he says some things to Thomas that are not written down. Um, he right. says, uh, Mac, pause this for a second. Right. So as a hierophant, you know, he, he is the, he is the one that teaches what those, that what those meanings mean. And then, like I said, in the gospel of Thomas, he literally says um, to Thomas things that they're not written down. Um, so a, as the hierophant, uh, I think that's gospel of Thomas uh, 13 as the hierophant, Jesus is the only one that can reveal uh, the interpretation of those teachings and, uh, and, and access, uh, access to the greater knowledge. Um, that uh, will result in, you know, the deification and the immortality, you know, the, the defiance of death. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's substantially different than uh, what you find in uh, <laughs> the gospel. So not the, there's an the gospels in the gospel of John. Right. Um, that's, that's, that's a whole, no, that's a whole nother level in mechanism of salvation. So um, let me ask you a question, Seth, because it's clear, you know, one of the reasons why I enjoy talking to you about Thomas is that it's clear to me that you're passionate about it as well as having a lot of knowledge uh, from your research. But you've been studying Thomas for a long time. You know, you encounter right. this material, like, I don't know, it must be now, I it guess. It be about th nine 13, years ago. 13 years ago or so? Yeah. yeah. So what, what makes Thomas so exciting to read and study, and why do you continue to, um, why do you continue to focus on it, it uh, in your own life, I mean, you're not in academia anymore, but you, you're well, still interested in Thomas and talking. For, about for one, there, there's, there's a promise. There's, there's that promise. The, you know, the, the defiance of death, right? That, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the invitation to become like God, which is, uh, that's interesting. Um, how could that yeah. not be appealing, right? Um, right? And that speaks much more to my, uh, my, my uh, spiritual, spiritual understanding uh, form of knowing uh, than. Uh, than saying just uh the faith uh but and i can come back to that but for two uh the the, the synoptic gospels and the gospel of john and well the, you know those are by way right those are greco roman biographies with a religious slant um you know it, it makes them it makes them uh it makes them special forms of by way you know uh their 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 religious interest um and uh, the gospel of john being the least historical of course uh with respect to that but the thing about the, the Gospel of Thomas is that it's an example of a Luke so fun, um, or what the uh, scholars say, the sayings of the wise. Um, the Luke so fun uh, is basically a collection of, of a teacher, you know, um, and uh, it, the Gospel of Thomas, the discovery of Gospel of Thomas uh, reinforces the thought uh, that there was another saying source, which I, does John say he uses a saying? So he does a miracle source and some other sources, right? And uh, the fact that, that Thomas is like one of those sources, right? That's a written form. Uh, scholars think Matthew and Luke used had a, a set of sayings uh, that, they, that they consulted, right? Uh, yeah. Along with Mark. Um, and uh, so uh, that's, that's important. It's just a completely different um, situation. Uh, you know, uh, Marvin Meyer says that there, there are Jewish, Greco Roman, and Christian examples of. Basically, uh, the, if you think of the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, those are uh, those are Jewish sayings of the wise. Um, Greek collections uh, known as um, Kyrie. Kyrie also have a certain like format 
they're formatted very similar to like the the syntax uh, and the uh, the just the the I don't want to say poetic, but the uh, the way they're formatting, right? Um, and uh, Patterson, Stephen Patterson, seems to think that those were used for evangelical purposes, uh, basically to to initiate people into the uh, into the cult. So, um, and into the cult, and uh, those examples were uh, by students Epicurus and Epictetus had uh, uh, had Logia so fun. Uh, again, uh, Q uh, and uh, basically. Basically, that's 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 a really big reason uh, that, that Thomas is excited to read the studies, just because it's it's another form of of of, of a literary genre in early in early Christian and in antiquity that we don't have many examples of, right? And to have a full form of one, uh, why shouldn't I study it, right? Yeah, um, certainly. That's, yeah. yeah, that's that's important. And then also the when you're talking about, um, I was talking about the. The uh, the mechanism of 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 salvation, you know, uh, and, and it also off offers uh, another perspective in early Christianity that we don't. Have. Early Christianity as a mystery religion, you know, uh, and then the mechanism of salvation coming through knowledge of Jesus uh, and and what it means to to become a twin of the living Christ. Right? Um, it's uh, it's certainly certainly uh, uh, one of the many reasons that uh, it's not in the canon. Right? Um, so. Gospel of Thomas. Can you address that just a little bit. Um, interested. Is it interesting text? There are. Uh, there's not only the Gospel of Thomas. There's the Acts of Thomas, and there's you know there's it's clear there was a Thomas side or a Thomasine, right of early Christianity, but none of those writings are in the canon of Orthodox, um, of the Proto-Orthodox to Orthodox Christian movement, and it's it's right. curious that. It represents an offshoot that wasn't um, that didn't make it into the mainstream of the Christian movement. And, you know, it's died out more or less, with the exception of sort of solitary adepts and monks like yourself. Um, right, right. But thrown to all kinds of extremes. The text actually says at one point, I don't recall the number, uh, but the you know the the ones who are called will be solitary and elect. Um, right, which is curious. Is sort of, is there's something about this text that seems to appeal to a more solitary path or a more re renunciate path. Um, but why didn't right. that? If if you know the mystery religion form was as popular as it was in antiquity, it was very popular, and there were uh, you know a more or less straightforward kind of mystery cult forms of the Jesus movement around. I'm just curious about if you have any hypotheses about what what that what made them not the mainstream. Well, I just don't know that they didn't serve the religious political purposes of what became the Catholic Church, so they weren't included. That's it's uh it's it's uh, kind of hard to control someone that's trying to become God, right? Uh, or becoming like God, right? Um, that's not gonna that's not going to fit very well to subjugated. Uh, you're not going to have servants that way. Uh, you're going to have gods that way, um, or people that are people that are like God, right? Um, you're, 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 no one's no one's going to bend the knee that way, um, and that did not serve. So you seem uh, to be implying that the mainstream of the Jesus movement was much more interested in being coherent with the political and social structures right. of the Roman world. Right, because that's it was. Yeah, I mean, it, it clearly wasn't that way at, you know, in the start, right? Um, well, you know, but they did they did execute the founder. Right, right, yeah. That, so that tells you that, uh, yeah. Well, what Jesus was doing wasn't wasn't uh, wasn't something that could be reconciled, you know, with with the with the Roman Empire. Except uh, then, you know, a few hundred years after he's uh, after he's left the earth, uh, they do reconcile it uh, rather forcibly, right? Mm. Um, you know, and thus you get, you get the Roman Catholic Church uh, and all of its power and, and, and glory, and, uh, and it's in so far, so far, uh, so far removed from uh, anything that was original uh, that it's, uh, it's either tragic or hilarious. I don't know which one. So some days I cry about it, some days I laugh about it. So yeah, um, so one of the things that's that, that this direction of our talk has got me wondering, and I feel like 
believe it or not, we've, we've recorded uh, nearly an hour, I think, at this point, and we're going to need to pull this to a close. But one of the things that this has got me wondering about is to what extent there might have been an overlap between the kinds of teachings that we think, uh, you know, a Jewish sage from Galilee, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, might have actually taught in history and what his Thomasine followers might have taught in Alexandria, you know, later right. that century or in the, early in the next, um, to what extent there was a good match between those teachings and their right. philosophical commitments. Right. So I mean, you know, this Jesus might in is, some sense be very authentic. In the Gospel of Mark, you know, he says, let those with ears to hear, hear, right? You know, let, let those who can understand, understand, you know, and it's, it's very clear uh, that all throughout the Gospels that uh, even Jesus' closest followers just don't get it. Mm. So, so there's something there's probably, hidden. Yeah, there's probably a, there was probably, probably a strain or a very lively strain of esotericism and mystery running through the, the man of Jesus himself, right? Um, you know, he, he gets up, he gets up early in the morning and prays and, you know, and does what he needs to do to, uh, and then he goes out and he, he, and he teaches teachings uh, with no interpretations, right? Um, and, you know, matter of fact, the Gospel of Mark, the parable of the sower, he doesn't tell the people the, the interpretations. The disciples come to him and ask him the interpretation, and he gives them the interpretation, and Peter still goes, huh? Yeah. You know, um, it's, there, there's this reoccurring theme that whatever Jesus was offering was not even readily understood by those that, uh, that were his closest followers, right? um so because it was not it was not of this world it was not of this empire it was it was a whole different system a whole different way of living and understanding and becoming and being so um and uh that's that's uh that's something that's appealed to me personally actually um so i you know talk about uh talk about uh, i identify as a thomasine christian uh, if i have to identify as any type of christian right um uh, which text which texts speak to me uh and uh greg riley uh this course uh, is the first semester, 8 a.m. course. You know how much I love 8 a.m. courses, um, but I did not miss a single one of these. Uh, it was early Christianity and Gnosticism, right? And I remember him saying, he says, Christians are always obsessed with, with how we return to God, right? He says, but the question that I've always asked is, how does the soul come into the world? How did we get here from God, right? Mm -hmm. um, did we come from God? And it says, well, you know, the hymn of the soul in the Acts of Thomas uh, answers that, right? And that's that's the story of the of the, the boy, the soul leaving the divine coming to the world, then and getting lost and the messenger coming and waking the soul up and him accomplishing his task and returning back uh, to his twin or to his robe. And so uh, that spoke to me then, but uh, you fast forward uh, a number of years, my daughter was born, right? Uh, and you know she is a piece of the divine uh, that had become flesh and was entrusted to me, right? I, I felt that uh, God had given God's self uh, a piece of me and that was probably that's my second mystical experience. Uh, my first mystical experience was at Mars Hill, of all places. Um, so, okay, me trying Seth, to find her. Seth, um, I want to thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your passion for the Gospel of Thomas. And I'm confident that uh, some of my students, in particular, are gonna are gonna be informed and enriched by right. seeing what you have to say about this text that I'm asking them to read. They're coming in pretty so, cold. Some of your uh, some of your former students actually stay in contact with me about. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas, and uh, so we'll yeah, just say so, if, you, uh, if you want to get in touch with Seth, give me a message, and I'll send along his email to you. Yes, uh, yeah, that that is though that is there, um, and uh, email. I'm also on Facebook. Um, you can you can find any of those things. Let's see. Um, 